the humerus. So, okay, let's get into skeletal anatomy today, where we're doing, last week was supposed to be heads and vertebrae, the axial skeleton, and then today was going to be arms and legs and fins, I guess. Uh, but we're going to do everything today because we have to. So let's move past that for now. Here's how uh, you could think of dividing up the skeleton. And I hope thinking about the Paleozoic and what we've already learned, especially this evolution amongst fishes, you can kind of see within your own body some of that vertebrate evolution we've already talked about. So a really simple way to divide the skeleton into like units is the axial skeleton, which is the middle part. It's your head and your vertebrae, and in your case, your ribs. If you think about that, that structure is like the ancestral vertebrate there, the like even before we've evolved pectoral fins and pelvic fins, that <laughs> tube within a tube, you're swimming forward, you have a backbone to flex your muscles against. So the skull, uh, in humans, the lower jaw is called a mandible. Um, jaw is the big word for any mouth on any vertebrate. That can have many different bones in it. You guys have only one bone in your lower jaw on each side called a dentary. That dentary is fused together right and left to make one big U-shaped thing that we call a mandible. So it is your jaw. The whole thing's called a mandible. There's two sides of it that are both called dentaries. So there's definitely hierarchies of words here we can talk about. Skull, you've already seen, has tons and tons of bones within it. We'll talk about that. Vertebrae have their own anatomy we'll talk about today. And we won't really do too much of ribs. I had to cut some stuff and ribs got the, you know, cut. <laughs> Sorry. And so the other way you can think about it is in the appendicular skeleton. Now that we've moved through the Devonian and our fishes have evolved limbs, arms and legs from their pectoral and pelvic fins, we can talk about the appendages, the arms and legs of vertebrates. And so what you guys can see is developmentally, there's a lot of similarity between your pectoral girdle and your pelvic girdle. The same kind of things. Uh, girdles in the middle that sometimes connect to the bone uh, of your back in the lower, the pelvic vertebrae, the pelvic region connects to the backbone. Your pectoral girdle is floating loose. Mammals are weirdos. We have very loose pectoral girdles compared to a lot of other vertebrates. There's not really a good midline connection. But in either case, one bone, two bones, a few bones, five somethings. One bone, two bones, a few bones, five somethings. There's a similar developmental regime in both your arms and your legs. And obviously across different animals, sometimes their arms and legs are doing really different things. But you have a humerus or a femur as the close in bone. Radius, oh, that's supposed to say tibia, sorry. All on fibula, carpals and tarsals, that's your wrist bones, your ankle bones, your metacarpals and metatarsals, that's your hand bones, your feet bones. In all cases, all your little finger and toe bones are called phalanges. An individual one is called a phalanx. Uh, there's some other fancier words we're gonna learn. But we're gonna get into all these here in a second. So the axial skeleton and an appendicular skeleton are your kind of foundational pieces to divide it up. I wanted to bring you guys back to this, this deuterostome embryo you've seen before. All bilaterians have three cell layers as an embryo, an ectoderm, an endoderm, and then between those two, a mesoderm, where most of your organs come from. When we talk about skeletons, you guys kind of already saw when I blabbed you about jaws, your skull is really where it's crazy. Your skull has pieces from all three tissue layers. Whereas the rest of your skeleton almost completely comes from mesoderm. Your vertebrae, your ribs, the entirety of your appendicular skeleton, with the exception of this one bone, <laughs> clavicle, comes from your endochondral bone in your mesoderm. So your skeleton has these very different levels of organization. I encourage you to kind of look back when we talked about jaws, because there's certain color codings there that can like help you out if you care about the development of origins of the skeleton. I heard Gary saying something when you guys were all talking about how one thing he likes what did you say about like bones? You realize like, oh, we still have that. Oh yeah, going through and seeing like things, how much things move. Like, oh, it used to be in the neck, now it's in your ear. Oh. Wait, you're this, this is like a gill cover, but now it's on my shoulder. Um, you're gonna learn some crazy stuff about mammal ears later on, actually, maybe Thursday, maybe Tuesday of this week. Um, but so we'll get into that. Most all your skeleton though is coming from your mesoderm. It's not your head. And so all that bone is endochondral. Endochondral bone coming out of the mesoderm, you guys have learned this already, has an endochondral, sorry, cartilaginous precursor, meaning that you have cells in your body, chondrocytes they're called, that lay down a cartilage lattice and then following those later on and as you're growing up, as you're living your life, when you get growing pains as a teenager, that's like bone being laid down again and again and again to fill in where that cartilage was. And so what's so cool is that long bones bones in your arms, bones in your legs, very much unlike bones in your skull or your backbone, your arms and your legs preserve these really, really, really um, 
observable patterns of growth. You can learn about an anim animal's metabolism. You can learn about how an animal grew up, things that happened in its life, based on the record of growth that's in long bone. And that's in part due to the fact that it gets laid down initially after cartilage gets laid down. And then as you live your life, it gets called remodeled. The bone is kind of worked over again. There's blood vessels and nerves in that bone. And so as you grow up, you replace the calcium, you move things around, you maybe break your leg and then it heals. You can learn all kinds of things inside this bone. And so I just like to remind you guys with these figures, like I don't do anything with medicine, but I'm always amazed because I think of bones as fossils. And when I realize how much blood and nerve is in there, um, it just makes me really happy to think what the living tissue that bone is. And so a good example of that is this. This is something we'll get into when we talk about dinosaurs. This is a tibia from a dinosaur bone, and it's from the part of the leg called the diaphysis. Every long bone, doesn't matter if it's a humerus, doesn't matter if it's a femur, doesn't matter if it's a finger bone, has a middle part that's kind of thin. They're all kind of shaped like this, like a cartoon dog bone, right? And that middle part's called the diaphysis. And that's usually where the most perfect record of growth is. Once you're up here, there's all kinds of other things happening where muscles are inserting. But here in the middle of the bone, we can get a really good record of growth. And so if you cut a dinosaur bone or anybody's bone, really, and look at it under a microscope, grind it so you can shine light through it, you can see all these little black dots are the spaces where individual cells live. All these long arcs in this bone right here. That's where there were blood vessels and nerves. You can see things like growth marks. These different rainbow colors, those are the actual collagen like protein fibers that were laid down while the bone was being formed. So you can learn a lot about like, oh, this dinosaur grew fast and then it got old and started to slow down its growth by looking at that diaphysis. And so I just think that's really cool. I wanted to give it to you now because we're talking about skeletons and that's before we get to dinosaurs. Any questions about that? Okay. So what I really want to have you guys do, though, is much more basic stuff than that. Just like labeling bones, drawing skeletons, making observations. That's what I care about happens today. How many of you are like pre-med or like on that track, going for PA or something, or nursing, dental? None of you? Post-med. Post-med, what a shame. <laughs> oh, I'm so delighted. I always have to feel like I have to unpack the brainwashed brains of students who are trying to be in the medical field because humans made up all these anatomical terms and like we're the only ones they apply to. And that's so dumb because as you well know, our skeletons are connected to all the other skeletons out there. So when we talk about directions, the first thing we're gonna to do today is teach you guys some anatomical directions when you're talking about bones, when you're describing a skeleton. The words are never appropriate to humans. Most vertebrates, if you look at them from the side, look something like this. Their backbones are horizontal and their heads are in the front. That's true of like a shark. That's true of a bird. That's true of this dog. So you always have to imagine, if none of you guys are medical people, I don't have to do this, but like, this is how you should imagine yourself <laughs> to have your skeleton make sense relative to the other ones. That'll make sense in a second. Basically, we have words that doctors use for like superior and inferior, and they mean like this way and that way, <laughs> and not this way, well, how the other animals are. So anyway, I guess that didn't work at all since none of you guys have that <laughs> brainwashing. So okay, here's what I want to do is give you some anatomical directions when you're talking about bones. Almost all these words, and this is actually, I should have said talking about anatomy, almost all these words are relative. You use them relative to one another. So looking at this fish, a uh, bow fin, it's called amia, and looking at that dog skeleton, we can use the same words to describe like positioning on that skeleton. So some of these are gonna be very straightforward. You already know them. Towards the front of the animal, towards the head, that's gonna be anterior. And towards the back of the animal is gonna be posterior towards the back. So that's that long axis, front to back, anterior and posterior. Uh, when we're talking about up and down, top and bottom, we call it dorsal when there's things above the animal. So you guys already know that, right? Dorsal fin is a pretty pretty uh, popular term. People already know what dorsal fins are. And the one you've heard me say a few times without ever really explaining it is ventral. Ventral is like your stomach towards the ground. So you can see why a human dorsal and ventral don't make sense because dorsal is this way and ventral is that way and anterior is that way and posterior is that way. So we're a little weird because we stand upright. But these are the words that are applied to all vertebrates and I would encourage you to use them in this class. If we look at the skeleton from the front, there's also words we can use to describe the anatomy that are helpful when you're like telling somebody else about a bone, telling somebody else about a fossil. All of us are bilaterians. That means we have a midline. You can divide your body in two and have it be pretty much symmetrical. Some of your organs are funny, but your skeleton, that's certainly the case. And so when we're talking about uh, skeletons in these orientations, we use words like medial to describe any bone or any feature that's towards the midline, towards that center point not crossing it. And then the other way is lateral. 
So you might hear somebody say something is mediolaterally compressed. That means it's thin. It's mediolaterally expanded. That means it's thick, if that makes sense. So that's true for the fish. That's true for the dog. These are helpful terms for just describing bones. If we look at a skull in ventral view, so this is that dog again, we're looking straight up. You guys are gonna have some, there's a dog back there. I can get more out if you want. Uh, when you look at it in ventral view, you're looking at the palate of the dog. Here's where the jaw muscles go. Here's the brain. Here's all these teeth. Here's some words that we're not gonna really be using today, but later on in class when we're doing a lot more with mammals, we don't have mammals yet in lecture. Uh, we're gonna be talking about their tooth rows. So starting up here with like your incisors and going back all the way here to your molars, there's words we can use to talk about the tooth row in animals. And so one word is mesial. If you're taking anything on the tooth row that's more towards the midline, that almost always does mean up towards the front of the animal. And then the other word for mesial, or sorry, the other word that goes against mesial is distal. So back towards the back. So medio, mesio distal, you can say how long the tooth row is in a dinosaur, how long the tooth row is in a mammal, features of where that big sharp tooth is, is it mesial to this or that molar, molar tooth? These are important words that you'll see again and again and again as we go forward, especially with amniotes. When we talk about the tooth row, we can also talk the inside and the outside of the mouth. So the outside of the mouth, anything on this side of the tooth and actually can be sort of other bones of the skull if we're talking about the immediate mouth area. The outside is labial, labial is lips, which maybe won't surprise you at all. Uh, and then the inside is lingual, so labiolingual. A tooth might be labiolingually expanded, which means it is wide. So lingual, your tongue is like lingual, it's for like, um, oh my gosh, forgetting the etymology of lingual. Doesn't mean speaking, forget what it means. But labiolingual are the two words we'll use there. And now we can talk about words for the limbs. So anterior and posterior for the whole bo animal's body, dorso and ventral for the whole animal's body. We're talking about the appendages, the arms and the legs of this dog, which can do the same thing on the fins of a fish. We use words like proximal if we're going up towards the center of the animal's body, up towards the center of mass. So that humerus is a very proximal bone within the forelimb. Distal, you already saw distal in referring to the tooth row, so that can be a little confusing, but distal is a word used to describe bones that are farther away from the center of the animal. So proximodistal is, a, is another, um, basically like framing we can use to like describe the shape of something. Any questions for any of these things or is it all pretty straightforward? I always feel like this is a funny part of class because I have to give you guys this stuff because um, I don't like just using it without, but it's a little, a little, a little silly. All right, so going through the skeleton, I want to go through the different names of bones, the bones that are important, the bones I want you guys to for sure have a handle on where they are. So let's start with the axial skeleton, which is the skull and jaws, the backbone, and the ribs. And so here's a bony fish skull. Um, Living and Jonathan are surrounded by this bone right now. There's a bunch of these skulls up here, and you guys are going to see. Uh, and so this is that fish skull. This is an osteichthyan, a bony fish. It's an actinopterygian, an early actinopterygian. And you can see here, it has a lot, a lot, a lot of bones. Almost all the bones in an osteichthyan skull are dermal bones. So from the ectoderm related to the bones we saw in those armored placoderms. And so bones like the premaxilla, the maxilla, the dentary, these are all within the skull, within the jaw. Those three, I hope you remember, are the bones that support the osteichthyan teeth, bones that support marginal teeth, a premax, a max, premaxilla, maxilla, and a dentary are the big marginal teeth supporting bones in all osteichthyans. So that fish has bones that you absolutely also have. There's also other bones here. I've only circled a few. I'm not gonna ever ask you to like remember all the bones and label all the bones, but I like to give you guys diagrams like this because if you're doing things for your project, if you're researching something, I want you to have something you can look back on. So N is the nasal, L here is lacrimal, FR is frontal. These are all bones you have in your face right now or on your head a frontal, a lacrimal, a nasal, that this osteichthyan also has. The jaw joint, the way this lower jaw moves relative to the skull, one of the bones in this fish that does that is the quadrate. If you guys look back on your jaw evolution slides, you'll see that the quadrate is actually not an ectoderm dermal bone. It's an endoderm, like gill skeleton bone, which is really crazy. And so that just goes to show you how complicated jaw evolution really is. This deep, deep, deep bone there is endochondral, unlike every of the other ones I've just circled. The skulls are complicated. Here's an early reptile. You can see this early reptile has, again, a lot of bones. It still has a maxilla, still has a premaxilla, a nasal, a lacrimal, a dentary, 
Here's a bunch of them listed for you if you care to know what they are. All I want you guys to take away from this slide is that as we get into animals like us on land, not fishes, but like amniotes running around, reptiles maybe, I hope you can see still a lot of bones, maybe more bones than you have in your skull, but definitely way less than a fish. So simplification of the skull is something that we do see with terrestrialization and mammals kind of take it to an extreme. Our skulls have very few bones compared to most reptiles. Your lower jaw is one bone, the dentary. Your dentary goes from here all the way to your chin. In this animal, the dentary is just part of the jaw. There's a bunch of other bones here that you do not have in your lower jaw. Anyway, there's some labels for you. Here's us. Obviously that's not you, but this is a dog or a wolf. And, they, and this dog has basically all the exact same bones you have. But again, the mammal skeleton, just like all skeletons, is supremely adaptable. Almost every single bone this dog has, you have in your face too. But this dog has been shaped in a very, very, very different way. And so still has premaxilla, still has a maxilla, but look how big it is, full of those deep, deep teeth, those osteopian teeth. A dentary down low in the red, nasal, above the nose, that's probably not too surprising. That lacrimal bone is there. That frontal bone is there. Jugal is the other bone that's uh, right here in your, your, people call it the zygomatic arch, your cheekbone, that's called the jugal. I'm giving you a lot of the mammal bones. Parietal, I'll let you write them down. Squamosal, occipital, dentary. I'll take you a second to write those down just so you know where they are. The other thing I hope you can see with this is like the mammal skull has so many fewer bones than that reptile skull has, and definitely way, way fewer bones than that fish skull has. There's still elements that are homologous, like maxilla, premaxilla, but nasal, but then there's like a big reduction of bones. And that happens in a couple ways through evolution. Sometimes our ancestors combine like ossification centers, what's three bones in a fish is one bone in you, or bones are lost altogether. There's other examples we can talk about where the bones become other parts of your anatomy, but we'll worry about that later. You definitely come back to this if you guys want. Okay, another thing that's important for you guys to have is when we're talking about uh, whole skeletons, we can talk about the vertebrae and the vertebral column. We can break that up into regions. And so I put the fish and the little early reptile and the dog all up on the slide. You guys have them in your notes so you can label the different regions of the vertebrae. You're gonna hear these words a lot. We're gonna start with the fish because that's like where we've been starting. <laughs> and so you can divide a fish's vertebral column up into very simple categories. The caudal vertebrae or the tail vertebrae. And this fish, that's a very small segment of vertebrae which is kind of going up like this, that like heterocircle-ish tail, you'll remember, where the vertebrae go up into the tail. This fish doesn't quite have that, but we'll worry about the details later. The back of a fish's vertebral column, the caudal vertebrae, the tail vertebrae. And then for most fishes, what people actually say, and this is like the lowest common denominator kind of anatomy, but it does work, is all the other vertebrae from the brain case of this fish, where the brain is right there, the spinal cord exits the brain, all the way back to those tail vertebrae called the precaudal vertebrae, vertebrae that are before the tail. Okay, that's in a fish. If you look at something like an early reptile, you still have caudal vertebrae, you still have tail vertebrae, of course, but there's a couple other things here. This is a tetrapod. Its pelvis, its pelvic girdle is now fused to the backbone. There's a little rib called a sacral rib that connects the backbone to the hip in one specific place on a bone called the ilium. And so those vertebrae, there might only be one or two, you have more than that, are called sacral vertebrae. You guys have a sacrum in your body, which is the term for that big mass of fused vertebrae that you have all together. The sacrum is made up of sacral vertebrae. In front of that, you could call the rest of this little animal's body pre-sacral. So you can see how there's caudal and pre-caudal in the fish. Caudal, now we have sacral, vertebrae that look different because they're fusing with the ilium. And then in front of that is pre-sacral vertebrae. Now in this animal, we absolutely can break up pre-sacral vertebrae 
into dorsal vertebrae. So this is not only dorsal, like the direction, like up, but it's literally your back, the backbone in like the torso, you can think of it as, of this little animal. And then the neck vertebrae, the cervical vertebrae. So cervical and dorsal vertebrae together could be called presacral vertebrae. Some people are fancy and call them cervicodorsal vertebrae when they're kind of like in this region. All of that together with sacral and then caudal. That's how we break up the vertebrae of a little reptile kind of guy. If we get to you, you probably have thought of words. Some of you I saw wrote down a couple of words on your sheets and only the mammal of these three animals has those words I saw you guys write down. So of course a dog has cervical vertebrae in its neck, sacral vertebrae in its pelvic area, call vertebrae in its tail, absolutely. But then what's interesting is that if we take the dorsal vertebrae of mammals, and this is only true for mammals, you can break, again, I'm gonna say this, only true for mammals, you can break that dorsal vertebrae up into thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae. You guys are weirdo humans and you stand upright and so you have problems with your back bending. People have lumbar pain, they need lumbar support. Your lumbar spine is the spine in a mammal that does not have ribs. You can think of these are rib hosting dorsal vertebrae that are called thoracic vertebrae. A lot of your really important organs are up in your rib cage, right, protected. And then kind of your guts are down here for the most part, meaning your digestive system in your lumbar vertebrae here, connected to your sacral vertebrae near your pelvis. So there are gonna be other animals we're gonna see that reduce their ribs and have things that kind of look like mammals, but a true like lumbar and thoracic set of dorsal vertebrae, that is a mammal feature. It's actually really important. We're gonna talk about it uh, in this week and next week when we talk about early mammal evolution, the evolution of a lumbar region of the vertebrae. So does that make sense that lumbar and thoracic are both dorsal, cervical and dorsal are all presacral? I hope you guys can see how these things kind of map onto some of what we've already learned about anatomy and evolution in like the Devonian when early tetrapods were coming out from their sarcophagian roots and getting up on the land. Questions about this? I know it's just basically like vocab. Okay. Some vertebral anatomy for you. I know this is quite a bit. So here's a dinosaur vertebra. You're looking at it in an anterior view. So that means you're looking at it right in the front, the front of the vertebrae. So this is not what you'd see if the animal was like laying there dead on the ground, right? This is if you took a vertebrae out and looked at it straight on. And then it's also in left lateral view. So looking at it from the side. And so there's only a few pieces of vertebral anatomy I want you guys to have being a vertebrate paleontology class. I think it's important. You can always divide a vertebrae into two main, a vertebra into two main components. One is the centrum. So that spool shape, it looks like a, you know, a little hockey puck kind of shape. Uh, it can be very different shapes in different animals, but the centrum, and then you can basically like cut through that centrum and above that is this big complicated structure and that structure is called the neural arch. And so oftentimes what happens in animals, you'll see it in fossils, you guys probably actually see it on some of the animals you look at today, the neural arch and the centrum fuse together through an animal's lifetime. So we actually can get a good sense of like how old an individual is, the ontogeny of an animal, depending on if it's like or neural arches are fused to its centrum or not. It's something that happens over the course of an animal's lifetime. Something that's really cool is different animals do it different ways. I, I was very delighted when I learned that crocodiles zip up from the back. They're one of the few, they like their caudal vertebrae start fusing the neural arch to the centrum and the neck is the end for them instead of going the other way. It's just a developmental thing. It's not really important, but it's a way we can assess an animal's age. And so for fossils, it can be really helpful if this is fused or if these are two pieces that fit together, but they're not fused. So you have plenty, you have all this anatomy in your body. That hole in the middle is called the neural canal. That's where your actual nerves, your spinal cord travels through. So when you slip a disc, you know, your discs are the things that are between your centra. That's what can pinch your spine and pinch your nerves and cause a lot of pain in your, ner your neural canal. The big part that sticks up off a vertebra is called the neural spine. When you run your hand down your dog's back or your cat's back, when you touch your own back, you're touching the tops of all your neural spines. That's the part that's like sticking backwards on you up in most animals. The things that stick off the side of the vertebrae, those are called transverse processes. And so transverse processes can do a lot of things. They can support muscles. They can support uh, locomotion for sure. It's also a place for ribs to attach on to the vertebrae. And in different parts of your vertebral column, the ribs, the ribs attach in different places. That's one of the things I'm electing not to bother telling you today, unfortunately. Something that's really important to me are these two words, and I want you to try your best to spell them. I will stop talking for a second so you can write them down correctly.
They're both pre and post, and then it's the same word after that. So when we were learning about Devonian tetrapods coming up out of the water, Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, those ones with eight or seven fingers, they could be differentiated from animals like Tiktaalik or the other Sarcopterygians because they had, one of the characters I gave you guys was zygopotheses. And so what that means is the vertebrae articulate with one another. In a fish, it's just like a spool and a spool and a spool and a spool. They don't have to be holding each other up. The zygopotheses are these processes. One goes forward, the pre zygopophysis anteriorly. The other one goes backwards, or posteriorly, the post zygopophysis So here's the pre zygopophysis right here on this dinosaur vertebra. And so a good rule of thumb, if you're trying to figure out which one's which, they touch each other, like they, they, they match up one vertebra following another. The pre zygopophysis are almost always doing this, facing up and in, and the post zygopophysis are almost always doing this, facing down and out. You can see how they fit together. This is the way for a vertebrate animal along its whole backbone to build structure up against gravity. Pre and post zygopotheses articulating with each other, holding the backbone up kind of on its own. You get legs up underneath it. So structure within the vertebral column. So zygopotheses are a big deal. When I was an undergrad like you guys, I volunteered in a paleontology lab and I had to type out like 2,000 characters about long neck dinosaurs, like phylogeny of long neck dinosaurs and like a million little observations. And I had to write the word zygopothesis a thousand times and no one ever told me what it was, but I was really good at spelling it. And then I understood it and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But he just told me to do it and I did it. Here's where the ribs attach. Um, I'm not gonna give you guys these words. I'm giving you the slide only because I want you to have them if you want them. Um, and there's some anatomy on a rib. There's two heads to a rib in a lot, but not all uh, animals up on land. And those are their names. You're not responsible for those. I'm not going to ask you things about those, but you're going to have these slides and I wanted to give that to you. Okay, now let's go into the appendicular skeleton. We just did the axial skeleton with the skull and jaws, the ribs and the ver vertebrae and the backbone, the vertebrae and the ribs. Now we'll get up into that appendicular skeleton. And so let's start with the forelimbs first. The, you know, the forelimbs are the ones up front, the ones that come from the pelvic fin, your pectoral girdle, your pectoral fins. And so there's a couple bones in that girdle that you guys should definitely know. You do not have all of them. You do have some of them. You do have a scapula, which here's a scapula on a big old long neck dinosaur. And here's a scapula in a pectoral region of a human. So you can see some of the bones are the same bones. So scapula, coracoid is one that a lot of reptiles have. You guys do not have coracoid anymore. Clavicle, collarbone. Other animals have things like interclavicles. What I care about though, is just that you know scapula, coracoid, some of these other bones, that's where they go. But then also that there is a articulation point in these shoulder girdle bones, and it moves to different bones and different clades of organisms where your humerus articulates. And a word I definitely want you guys to have is that the glenoid is the name of the like concave area in all animals tetrapods, where the humerus articulates. So the glenoid articulation, uh, you can see in this dinosaur, it's shared between the scapula and the coracoid. And these dinosaurs, these bones fuse up. And sometimes this whole thing is called the scapula coracoid. And the humerus articulates in the glenoid right there. For you guys, you have a scapula only. This is you like without your ribs, looking from the front. So you have your scapula going down your back, your shoulder blade, and then your humerus articulates with a glenoid that is only on the scapula but it's still the same articulation. There's that glenoid on the dinosaur. Bones of the forelimb. This is where I have you guys, I'm happy that you did that exercise where I had you label bones all by yourself. So your bones are pretty straightforward. There's your upper arm bone called the humerus. And then you have your radius and your ulna in this part of your arm, your forearm. And so one thing you can use to help tell, your, tell these apart your ulna is always the one that makes the elbow. That's true in all the other animals too. So if you find the one that goes past your humerus, if you hit your nerves right here, it's your funny bone, right? That's your ulna. And then your radius is on the inside. It's kind of the, the medial one. Ulna is lateral, uh, radius is medial. That's your forearm. All your wrist bones are called carpals. We're gonna get into some carpal details way later in class, but it's just a little mess of bones right here. I'm not gonna ask you to know all of them, but please know, of course, they all have names. Metacarpals are your finger bones. 
not your fingers, more like the bone, I guess your hand bones, I should say, the bones in your hand, like in you and your palm. And then here's your phalanges, your little fingers. And so one thing that I always really enjoy about skeletons is how animals use the same underlying structures to adapt to different things. You guys have seen figures like this ever since you were in like middle school or high school biology, right? A human, a cat, a whale, a bat. I threw in an animal from the Permian, an early, an early tetrapod. That's its forelimb right there in the front. This is a very ancient structure. And you can make a wing, you can make a flipper, you can make a claw, you can make a human climbing hand. It's very, very awesome that we all have these same bones. A whale and a bat and a cat and a human are all mammals. So it's literally in every detail the exact same bones um, being used in completely different ways. So those are the bones of your forelimb. Once we go back to your hind limb, I'm having a little zoom in here at first on your pelvic girdle. This is one I heard you guys kind of chatting about. Some people wrote hip. Some people wrote hip bones, some people wrote pelvis. You have a pelvis that is this whole structure, both sides together is called your pelvis, this huge thing. This is six different bones. You each have an ilium, a pubis, and an ischium on each side of your vertebra, uh, each side of your body. So altogether, there's six bones to make up the whole pelvis. Your ilium is the one that is your hip bone. That's this one you feel on the side of your body. And your ilium, just like in animals like Acanthostega, is the only one of these three bones that articulates with your backbone. Your sacrum, all these sacral vertebrae fused together, one, two, three, four, five, fuses with your ilium and only your ilium. That's your little silly tailbone. We're not going to talk about that today. Pubis in the front, ischium in the back. And what I like is, look over there. There's a dinosaur, an ostrich dinosaur in this case. That dinosaur also only has six bones on both sides of its pelvis together. On each side, it has an ilium, an ischium, and a pubis. The exact same bones you have, homologous to the bones you have at the dinosaur pelvis, which is very, very, very cool. The femur, big bone of your leg, your upper thigh, fits into your hips, fits, fits into your pelvis in a, a hole called the acetabulum. So on the pectoral girdle, you have a glenoid that the humerus fits into. On the pelvic girdle, you have an acetabulum that your femur fits into. There's that acetabulum. Here's the hind limb, just like before. So a pelvic girdle up top and one bone at the top, a femur. Almost all of you wrote femur, so congratulations. Uh, tibia and fibula. The tibia is big and medial. The fibula is smaller and lateral, usually. Some animals lose their fibulae altogether, which is kind of interesting. Um, you have your tarsal bones, which is, are your ankle bones, carpals in your hands, tarsals in your ankle, uh, sorry, carpals in your wrist, tarsals in your ankles. Then you have your foot bones, which are your metatarsals. And then just like in your hand, your toes are called phalanges. Single one by itself is called a phalanx. I think this is so fun. We can trace the skeleton just like we can in the hands across different kinds of animals and it's all the same bones. So here's your foot, like a ballerina standing up on tiptoe, Tibia, tarsal bones, metatarsal bones, phalanx of digit three right here. And here's what a horse is doing. A horse's foot, small is with your foot, but down to one single digit that that horse is standing on. But it's still this very deep homology. Same bones making extremely different shapes, in this case in the hind limb. One last little detail I want to talk to you guys about is kind of a nomenclature thing, just like we talked about anatomical directions, lateral and ventral and things like that, is digit numbering. So medial is towards the midline, right? So if you guys look down at your feet or if you put your hands out straight, some of your digits are medial, your thumb, and some of your digits are lateral, your pinky. And so how we number the digits in different animals is from medial to lateral. So when I say you guys have five digits, I mean you have one, two, three, four, five. This is digit one. Digit two, digit three, digit four, digit five. Might be different in your feet, how many you have anyway, but that's always the system. And so in this bat, it goes one, two, three, four, five. In this turtle, it goes one, two, three, four, five, medial to lateral. So that's why we can talk about this horse and say that horse is on digit three. I like doing this every time. The horse is down on these in its hands and in its feet, it's on digit three only. So it's not like, oh, a horse only has one finger. No, it only has the one, this is the one it actually has. Birds have two, three, and four. And that actually might be, we'll talk about it later. It's complicated. But so this is what is important to me to have you guys know is that all these digits have an identity developmentally and we can trace that through evolution. And the way you number, medial, collateral on the outside, just to say that. Okay, 
I think I will probably take a chill pill on saying so many things to you guys. I really despise like lecturing straight and just especially just telling you now. Um, so I'm going to turn some lights on. The next several pages of your lab are what we're going to be doing here for like the rest of class. So let me walk you around here. I'm having you look at all kinds of different animals, all kinds of different skeletons. And I hope uh, doing some exercises that'll help you get comfortable looking at things and seeing things for yourself. We'll start back here. We have a microscope with some tunicates and some antioxidants, a little red slit, some non vertebrate chordates on microscope slides back here. And then you go through the lab, this is kind of the order it's in. Absolutely adorable old museum models of early jawless fishes that I encourage you to enjoy. Sharks are right here, cartilaginous nathostomes. Up here is some actinopterygians, bony fishes, bony nathostomes. Here's some amphibians, salamanders and frogs. There's some reptiles, turtles, crocodiles, lizards. Over here is uh, some comparative birds with an opossum. Some fun vertebrae, I won't say what they are. Some skulls of mammals right here. And then more fun mystery stuff, and you'll see what it is as you go through the sphere. So I don't have any other structure for you other than spend the next amount of time going through this, doing what you can. Work together, work alone, up to you. I think it's more fun together, uh, but go for it. Cool. Let's do it. Do you want to look at it?